with another Clemson Dubcast Saturday, April 17th. Hope everybody out there is having a great weekend. Currently, TigerIllustrated.com, the Danny Ford Days series continues. Part 12 is up. Tigers moving, I guess, 86, moving out of probation and into their more sort of uh, powerful cells, but no shortage of controversies and he said, he said, he said, she said, all kinds of stuff. Just what a wild time. Really makes you appreciate where things are right now under Dabo Sweeney in the current glory days. And that's a lot of what we're going to cover when our guest Billy Davis joins us. Title sponsor of the Dubcast since the very beginning, back in August of 2018, Parm Smith and Arts and Hold Law Firm in downtown Greenville. They want you to know that their office remains open and available to serve you during the COVID-19 crisis. They are also offering their clients the ability to meet via telephone or through video conferencing. Whether you have a loved one who has suffered from a car accident, defective product, a neglectful nursing home facility, or medical malpractice issue, Parm Smith and Arts and Hold's Greenville lawyers can provide the protection and guidance you need. Free consultations, 864-990-458. Eight one or on the web at parhamlaw.com. That's P-A-R-H-A-M law.com. Solero Communications, formerly known as Tandem Payment, is a full-service integrated electronic payments provider powered by leading-edge technology. Solero provides a wide array of merchant solutions, simplified payments. They make onboarding, taking payments, maintaining risk management and compliance, and getting support quick and easy. At Solero, they're all about helping you achieve sustainable growth as a business. Taking payments isn't the only thing your business needs. With Solero, Arrows Solutions, you can manage inventory, sell products and services via social media, schedule staff, track sales, get reports, and much, much more. Find out more about Solero at solerocommerce.com. That's C-E-L-E-R-O commerce.com. If you're in the Eastern Midlands and PD area and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803-774-0435 or go to UptownRealtySC.com. To our guest. Former Clemson Tiger, former Secret Serviceman, friend of TigerIllustrated.com, frequent contributor on the West End Zone message board. All right, here we go. Fun conversation here. All right, joined by my friend Billy Davis, a repeat visitor to the Clemson Dubcast. How you doing, man? Good, buddy. Thanks for having me on again. We really enjoy uh, doing this, and um, I think this might be episode two or three at least, but uh, we're doing good. Thanks, Like I said, thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're currently in lovely Lexington, Kentucky, visiting your daughter, Sophie, who's a, a, swim, a freshman uh, swimmer for the, for the Kentucky Wildcats. How cool is, is this for you? Uh, you know, it, it's it's truly remarkable to see her growth and development and for somebody like you that has a daughter that's you know phenomenal runner in eighth grade in eighth grade there in south carolina um you certainly understand um watching your child grow and um achieve things and and see them work really hard both in the classroom and you know athletically to get to in Sophie's case, um, essentially the pinnacle of her sport, other than if you make the U S national team or you're on the Olympic team, because, uh, there is professional swimming, but it's really not, it's, it's different than like the NFL or the NBA. So, um, the pinnacle of the sport as an amateur, obviously is swimming in a place like Kentucky, you know, Southeastern conference or Virginia and the ACC. So, and, um, so it's been fantastic, right? Uh, goes really fast, but couldn't be more proud of her and happy of her. She, you know, she's an academic all conference. She lettered, um, swam very well after going through the COVID protocols where she missed, uh, four months of swimming back last summer, which is, uh, but it, it's really neat to see. And, uh, they won the Southeastern conference championship this year for the first time ever in this, in the program's history. Wow. So, yeah, so there you go. You got a, um, a Southeastern Conference champion in the family, so um, that's that's neat for us to see. You know, obviously, you know my background, and then have another another family member win an SEC championship is uh, is really cool. So it's guys' limit for her. Thanks for asking. Can you confirm that it just means more in the SEC? 
Um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm an ACC guy. Well, I'm, but I'm an SEC guy now too. And um, I don't know if it means more, but I can tell you one thing: the facilities they have here at the University of Kentucky, not just for the football and basketball programs, but for everyone from swimming to gymnastics to volleyball to track and field to baseball to softball are phenomenal. And they do, uh, you know, the swimmers get to eat at the training table here at Kentucky. They have their own nutrition lab. They have their own strength training coaches. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it actually means more, but they put a lot into it. And I think that's a direct result of the money that pours back in to each individual school from the, you know, the, the football and basketball contracts. There's just a lot of money. And, and so everybody, you know, it's, it's, the, it's almost like trickle down economic effect. You know, they get a lot of money and they, they spend it. They don't sit on it. And it's, and then the proofs in the pudding like at Kentucky, not last year due to COVID, but the year before CBS sports did a ranking of all college athletic programs in you know, NCAA Division One, Michigan was ranked first, and Kentucky was ranked second for overall sports program. So wow. most people don't know that, but uh, yeah, they're very they take everything very seriously here. And most people don't know about just how demanding the so-called lesser sports or the non-revenue sports are. You know, with so much focus on 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 football. In, in basketball, there's maybe a common assumption that it's more of a leisurely pursuit. But you were telling me yesterday when we were talking that, like, the swim team might have had, like, a day off after the season, and then they ramp up two-a-days, like, right off the bat? Yes, correct. They, they, they work really hard all year round. Um, you know, playing football and baseball at Clemson, you work hard all year round. But I think – it's just like cross country and running track for your daughter. I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize, like you said, the sports that don't get the notoriety, the amount of work that these kids put in, like for the swim team, you know, they're doing two days, they're lifting weights. Um, and it's constant. It never stops. They get a day or two off and they're expected to be right back there. And there's a, there's a limit the NCAA puts on it. It's a, you know, eight hour rule off season. So, but they pack as much as they can into it while they can, because a lot of these young ladies and young men on the, on the men's side of the uh, program have Olympic trials aspirations. And, and so they, they, they train all year round, like next month, um, Sophie's going to swim at uh, Georgia tech in Atlanta. And a lot of the, it's, it's, you have to pay for it yourself. So she has to, she'll drive down from Kentucky pay for the hotel room but she trains at kentucky all summer to be able to hit these national meets and the fact of the matter is 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 most people know i mean most people 99.9 percent of the population really only pays attention to swimming once every four years for about a week Mm -hmm. and it's the olympics but they don't realize that there's ncaa championships and there's pan pacific championships and there's national championships and all those things that roll into it that these young men and women, you know, work their whole lives for. And they work to drop a half a second, two seconds, you know, a tenth of a second. Because you get to this level, the very tip top of the pyramid, and it's um, you win and lose by hundreds of a second, which is hard to fathom. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, but most people, it's just not a, it's not a sport that people pay a lot of money and attention to to watch. And I understand that. So, and I, and I didn't until, you know, our daughter took up the sport, but, um, they do deserve a lot of credit and academically, you know, I mean, they, she's a perfect 4.0. It was in high school as well. So, and I think, I think it runs along. There's, she's so disciplined in the water and that carries over to her classroom work. And so, and that's the way a lot of these kids are. I don't even want their GPA is GPA is a team, but it's like 3.8 something. Just, it's ridiculous how, how these kids are wired into what they do. So, um, it's great. There's a lot of good kids out there. They just don't get the attention they deserve. But at, at Kentucky, they, you know, they had their pictures, uh, taken as a team last Friday. And then, uh, you know, the athletic director was having a, a dinner for them to celebrate their achievement. So Mitch Barnhart is the AD here at Kentucky and he does, he does a phenomenal job. I apologize for not being informed on this, but how, how are scholarships allocated across a swimming team? 
Um, that's a great question. I, I believe there's only, I think for women, and I, I don't hold me this because I'm not sure, but I think it's 13 full rides are allotted for women swimming. That's it. And there's like with Cle- um, Clemson, Kentucky has about uh, 35 to 38 girls on um, on the team. So you can do the math on that. It's kind of like 11.7 scholarships for baseball. So the majority of the girls, to include our daughter, are on academic scholarships. And then uh, they're just a very small percentage of, of athletic. So Sophie's on mostly an academic scholarship. Mm-hmm. And that's how they can do it. At a place like Kentucky, at a place like Alabama or Auburn, um, you know, uh, so if you had really high SATs and a perfect 4.0, so she automatically qualifies. And that's how they do that at a lot of these bigger schools. They can bring a lot of girls in on academic scholarships and then and then boost it through through that. So they can build a really strong program basically through academics because of the, the, the limited um, athletic scholarship money that's available. So unlike football, you know, automatic 85 full rides, um, they divvy it up here. So that, that's how they do it. I'm pretty sure it's 13, but don't hold me to that. Yeah. But I mean, you know, 35, 38 girls on the team. That's it's a lot of bodies. Yeah. It, if if Clemson had a swimming team, would would she be here? Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt she would have gone there, but uh, it wasn't meant to be. Unfortunately, they dropped their program a long time ago, and um, it's very really sad when we found out because that's what she wanted to do. That was one of her goals. But she was only nine or ten years old, I think, at the time. But yeah, she would definitely have been a Clemson if uh, if they still had a program. But that you know that wasn't meant to be. So we uh, she just fell in love with uh, the University of Kentucky, and they fell in love with her, and it was a perfect match. So um, and that's why we're here. So you'll see, you'll see if your daughter keeps going at the rate she is, you're going to go through the same stuff. It's an interesting process. It's a lot more interesting as you go through as a parent than it is when you go through as an athlete. That's for sure. Yeah. What? Uh, so even when she was nine and ten, she was a, a, a very much devoted swimmer and and thinking that far ahead. Yeah, she was. Um, she started swimming year round when she was seven, and so it all happened by accident she's a very very talented uh, softball player soccer player all around athlete and um we moved back home to virginia in 2007 uh, from atlanta and she was six years old and we we live, we live in a very rural part of northwestern loudon county virginia we live on a gravel road on acreage so we really don't have any neighbors that are close and so my wife said hey there's this little swim team called the lovettsville dolphins would you be interested in you know, with the girls, you think they'd like to swim. And I'm like, swimming? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, what, whatever. That, that sounds like fun. Well, she started doing that. And about two meets into it, she was at the end of the pool. It crushed everybody, like, in the 25-yard freestyle. You know, the other kids are hanging on the edge of the pool or over on the, on the lane lines. And they're like, is that your daughter? We're like, yeah. And they go, she needs to be something a little more accelerated than <laughs> summer league swimming. So we put her in a year-round program. By the time she was nine, um, we actually went into Chris Ip. Remember, Chris Ip yeah. used to be the uh, head uh, swim coach at Clemson. And so we went into Coach Ip's office, and I had known him just from being around. And I said, Hey, Coach, this is, uh, this is my daughter, Sophie. You know? And of course, you know, everybody, oh, yeah, that's nice. She's how old is she? She's nine. And, uh, but she had qualified for Eastern Zone Championships as a nine year old. And so I, I go, she's, she's really pretty good. And she, you know, really interested in, and he goes, Oh, that's cute. And he goes, what's your name? And, you know, so he looks up her times and he looks at me and he goes, Sophie, if you keep going at the rate you're going, we'd love to have you swim here at Clemson. Cause he could already tell by her times where she was as a nine year old that she projected to, you know, swim at, a, you know, a division one level. That's how fast she was. So, uh, yeah, so she's had the drive. So and that's what it is, whether it's football, basketball, cross country, swimming, whatever it is, you got to have that inner drive to get there because it's a lot of people can do it in high school and can, you know, receive the awards in high school, but to get to, to get to this next level of where they're at is, uh, you know, they're elite. There's no doubt about it. When you heard that the, uh, Clemson's Clemson had made the decision, uh, to end its track program, uh, 
what was your what was your reaction to that? I was disappointed for the kids because I know how much they put into it, and um, it, it it paralleled what we went through years ago with the swim swim and dive team, you know, and um, I, I felt bad for because I know for years Clemson was you know just a, a tremendous uh, track program, indoor and outdoor. And so, uh, you know, but it, that's just the cost of doing business. Unfortunately, these days, you know, in the NCAA is just uh, in Clemson, you know, we're not, it's, it's, just, it's just, it's a smaller size school with a big footprint or a big paw print or whatever you want to say it. So they, you really have to be judicious as far as the athletic, the scholarships and how they're going to run the programs and how much money they're going to put into it. And, um, I don't know. I didn't follow it that closely, but I imagine, you know, the COVID circumstances might have had something to do with it because everybody's kind of, for lack of a better term, taking it in the shorts. So, um, but it paralleled what, uh, what we went through, you know, those years ago when they decided to drop the swim and dive. As a matter of fact, Sophie was sitting at practice one day waiting to, and I had, I, I knew about it and I, I didn't have to even have the heart to tell her. And then one of her coaches swam at Duke for a club team he walked in and he goes hey mr davis i'm so sorry to hear about clemson dropping their swim program and i was like oh no Uh and i looked over she was bawling Mm -hmm. crying i mean absolutely devastated so um yeah and she's you know i mean she's a she's a clemson tiger through and through she went to her first game when she was six weeks old but uh still a clemson fan but you know she's now she bleeds, uh, you know, blue and white. So that's that's how life goes. But I, I do believe, once again, everything happens for a reason. And this is where she's supposed to be. So that's the way we look at it. You mentioned the stark difference between going through, uh, going through it as an athlete, and then uh, experiencing it as a parent of an athlete. Can can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think, well, one is just sitting in the stands. I'm so much more nervous watching her perform at this level or any level than I ever was as an athlete because it was out of my control, you know, and it's, and you know how hard they work and, you know, and swimming is different than a lot of sports. I mean, we were up, you know, over the summer and I know we've talked offline about this, but she used to, we lived in Lovettsville, Virginia, still do. And she would practice in the morning in Vienna, Virginia, which is 45 miles from where we live. And we'd leave the house at 10 minutes after 3 a.m. and get to Vienna at about 10 after 4 a.m. And then I would get out with her coach, and it was outdoor swim practice at a 50-meter pool. We'd have to pull the covers off the pool and put the lane lines out at 4 o'clock in the morning for all those kids to get in the water at 4.30 a.m to swim for three hours. Wow. And that's, that was every day during the summer, except, except Saturday. Jeez. <laughs> cause they had me. Yeah. Cause they had, they had summer swim team meets on Saturday. So that's every day you're up, either myself or my wife were up at three to leave the house at three ten. I mean, it's the middle of the night, but that's the only thing people go wise out and go, well, you know, pools in the summertime, you know, people have memberships and they can't have practice in the afternoon or, or during the day. So they have to do it in the middle of the night to be able to get it in. And that's, and then when she was younger, I mean, we, she practiced twice a day when she was 11, 12, 13 years old, we drive with same thing. We'd leave the house at three fifteen and get to a pool, which was 45 minutes away. And she'd be in the water for two and a half hours We'd go home, homeschool her, and then she'd be back in the water in Tyson's Corner, which is another 45 minutes from 4 to 6.45 p.m., and then back home. So that when she was, that's 11, 12, 13 years old, she was practicing twice a day. So it was just, uh, yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, you can't even, it's too ridiculous. People said, you know, you're really committed. And I said, yeah, we should be committed. That's for sure, because <laughs> it's the, the time that you put in, and the, as hard as they work for you know minimal accolades, because no one really pays attention to it. It takes a special breed, that's for sure. I, I you know, I was, I, I marvel at her because it was like, hey, I'm a ball player. I got to have a ball to concentrate. Ball, you know, football, basketball, baseball, whatever it was. But those kids just get in a pool and look at a black line. It's amazing what they do. It really is. But um, 
you know, it was a means to an end for her, got her an education. And, uh, and, and, you know, this past year, just like all the other sports, she'll get a, another year to, to come back because they gave him a free year for COVID. So if she wants to come back and swim that fifth year and work on her masters, she'll be able to do that too. So what's, uh, what's the parent, Billy Davis like during events like when she's in middle school and high school are you do you keep to yourself or are you yeah. okay yeah I go up and sit in the stands by myself and watch her swim and then go walk around and do whatever because hey, swim parents are like softball parents that are like baseball parents or like basketball <laughs> parents most of them most of them are unbearable yeah and so I can't I can't listen to them talk because in the, in the most unbearable ones are people that don't have a clue of what's going on and never did it. So I got to the point where I'd either, and the, the great thing is with swimming is that as a parent, they need you to volunteer. So a lot of times I would volunteer as a, as a timer and be the head timer. And my wife was an official. So she was a stroke and turn judge. And then she was a starter and a referee. So the two of us would down on the deck and I'd be, you know, I'd be, dealing with stars and the head timer runs all, you know, hands out all the watches and does all that stuff. So I, I would keep busy doing that. And that would keep me from being up in the stands, listening to all the, the expert commentary. <laughs> so, and if I didn't do that, then I'd just sit in the corner and then she'd get done with her event. And I'd just go outside and do something and get away from it because, uh, it was on the really, really competitive meets, not the summer swim league stuff where, you know, that wasn't very competitive for her for all. But when you start getting into the national meets and in the DC metro area where every meet, um, you know, this is one of the three swimming hotbeds in the country, the Baltimore, Washington area, one of them. And then, uh, Texas and California and Florida, those three or four places. But, um, all of our big time meets were super competitive. Everybody out there was either swimming high level division one or Olympic trials qualifier. And you got to remember Katie Ledecky, um, who every, I think everyone knows of barely follows swimming. She's in the same, was in the same year round swim club as our daughter, nation's capital swim club. Mm. So produces a, an unbelievable number of high level division one swimmers and Olympic trials qualifiers. So, um, very competitive area for that, for that sport. So at, at cross country and track meets for the last couple of years, there's always, you know, the screaming parents that are like, come on, focus, you know, and you got to <laughs> exactly. want it. You know, and, I, and so one time <laughs> I, I asked my daughter, I'm like, you, if I did that, would that help? And she's like, no. <laughs> she'd be like, mortified. It's, it's Absolutely like you're, mortified. You're, you're already, I mean, you're in your own head during a race or in any kind of competition. And so, I mean, you know to focus. <laughs> like, you don't need to be told you know, uh, well, yeah, I, well, exactly. It's like being up to bat at baseball and someone yelling, "Hey, focus!" Oh, yeah. what do you think I'm doing? That somebody's <laughs> throwing ninety miles an hour, and they're not, I'm not focused. Yeah, exactly. But parents, you know, it's like they used to say that old show. Kids say the darnest things. Well, parents one up the kids all the time with some of the stuff that comes out of their mouth. And I think that's as anybody out there right now that's listening, that's a parent that's ever had a kid play any kind of sport. They know what I'm talking about. I had a I had a theory and an idea that I I just wanted to start a little league baseball program or basketball or football, whatever, pick your sport, where it would just be the coaches and the umpires slash referees. The parents would come, drop the kids off, and three hours later you come back and pick them up. Yeah. And let the kids let the kids play the game, let the you know, and let them figure it out on their own without mom and dad there um, screaming at them and screaming at the umpires and screaming at the coaches. Uh, I think that would do the kids a world of good. And I think a lot of times too, now it's interesting. Um, when I was growing up, you know, I'm older than you, I'm almost 60, but we used to play a lot of pickup like baseball where like be four dudes and be like, Hey, you and I would play, you know, Jimmy and Johnny. And uh, since I bat left-handed, you know, right field was poison and then you could only hit the left field. And you know, you had ghost runners, and you went out and played a lot on your own, and you learned how to run the bases and, and do a lot of the fundamental things. And now everything is so organized, you know, that everything has to be everything's organized, and it's a coaching, and you got travel ball, and everybody's got to go to clinics, and everybody's got to go, you know, to the batting cage. And I'm not sure that a whole lot of kids spend a whole lot of time playing ball when it's not organized by the parents. So um, I don't think that's 
I don't think that's good. You know, it produces a lot of great ball players, but I don't know if that's really good. Sometimes the fundamentals have been lost. But you learn a lot. You learn a lot on your own, just playing out on your own without somebody te- teaching you how to do it. And then it becomes instinctual. But that's just a little theory I have. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see, you know, you know, just like basketball. You learn, you learn how to play hoops, not by playing travel, AAU ball, by going to play pickup. You know, like I used outside of DC, you drive down 15 minutes, you go down to the playground and you play, you know, make it, take it. We win, you know, you win and you stay and you stay on the court as long as you win. You learn how to play basketball at a high level. You don't have to go play, you know, drive six hours to play in some tournament. Go down, <clears throat> play pickup ball. That's where you learn how to play ball. So, and you, uh, I mean, like, you know, youth softball, like elementary school kids, you know, rec softball here at Clemson or whatever sport, I guess. But at that age, the intensity outside the fence <laughs> and often in the in the dugout with the coaches is 10 times what it is with the kids who are just sort of there like, OK, we're just here to to have fun yeah. and, it's, and you no, can exactly. almost, you can well, almost that, see that's the, what it's supposed to be fun. That's why they say you play it. Right? Let's go out and play a game. I mean, you know, and, and, you know it, it does take away from the, from the kids for having fun because they're afraid to do anything wrong, you know, for fear of mom and or dad, you know, jumping down their throat about it. You know, uh, you know, and how, you know, how many times have you gone back in the parking lot and seen a parent yell at a kid because, you know, he committed an error or he struck out with the bases loaded? Like, like you know, like yelling at him is going to help him at all. Right. You know, I mean, and believe me, that kid is going to remember that a lot longer than he's going to remember anything else. That his dad is chewing on him because, you know, he struck out in a, a 10 u you know, a 10 u baseball game like anybody. Because most of those kids playing 10 u baseball, they most of them aren't going to play varsity baseball in high school. That's a fact. That is an actual fact that you can look it up. It's just like when swimming, they call a lot of the, the kids that dominate at 10 and under it's swimming. They call them 10 and under wonders because by the time they're teenagers, about 85% of them have dropped out of swimming. They don't even swim anymore. Wow. So, yeah, because it's just too hard. And a lot of guys drop out because they, they swim when they're younger and then when they get older, you know, they want to play, they want to play football, basketball, baseball, lacrosse, whatever it is. So they get out of the swimming. So there's probably a three to one ratio of girls to guys by the time you get to be teenagers because a lot of the guys drop out. But, um, yeah, it's the same way. You know, everybody, you know, the, the pressure, and I don't know what it's always been there. I remember playing a little league baseball and parents yelling, but I think every generation it gets a little more. And I think this travel, this travel stuff, which I wish I'd have gotten in on that monopoly of the travel and figured it out. I wasn't smart enough to figure it out. But somebody's at the top of the food chain making a lot of money off all these yeah. tournaments. Yeah. You know? I mean, do you really have to travel from Greenville, South Carolina to Florida to buy? I mean, I know for a fact where we live in the DC metro area, Baltimore, Washington area, within an hour to an hour and a half, you can find all the competition you want in any sport. Period. Football, basketball, baseball, swimming, track and field, whatever it is, because it's a highly competitive area. There's a lot of money. There's a, there's a lot of great athletes to come out of here. You don't have to travel to California to go to some, you know, just to buy a $30 T-shirt and, you know, drop $3,000 just to say you played in, a, in some travel tournament. It's not going to really make you any better. But that's that's how we've that's how it's come now in sports. You know, I mean, with Soph, the only time she'd ever travel anywhere was like a national meet, junior nationals or nationals or whatever it want to be. And that was three or four times a year. Everything else was done right in the metro area. Didn't need to go anywhere. All the competition is right here. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can get as fast as you want to be. You don't need to you don't need to travel all over the place to do it. So. Not to get too heavy into the psychoanalysis of of parents of of of, yeah. of rec athletes, but as far as like the you know middle school, elementary school, the, the intensity and the seriousness of it that you that you have seen and that we all see, do you think it's something as tangible as hey, my kid's going to get a scholarship, or is it more abstract? Like we put so much into this all year, so. 
I'm going to be hyper competitive uh, when I see my son or daughter out there. Do you have any any sort of conclusion or explanation? I, I, yeah, for this? you know what? I think a lot of it is because people see how much money's involved now in scholarships and pro baseball, and everybody thinks their kid the next kid's going to be the next Mike Trout. Or um, you know, and the chances that happening are just infinitesimal. But I think uh, you know, I mean, how many kids even get a Division One scholarship? I mean. It, or play anywhere in college, whether it's one division one, two or three. Um, but it's, it's the, it's the way we are now in a society where, and there is a lot of money out there. And, and I think a lot of it does have to do with that as, as opposed to, Hey, we just put a lot of time and effort into this. Um, they have this illusion that, w- you know, this is going to be a stepping stone just because, you know, Johnny hit two home runs in the, in the nine U baseball game that he's going to be, you know, the next Juan Soto. Right. So it's, you know, I mean, it doesn't work that way. It's nice. And then, you know, especially with boys and not so much good, but especially with boys, you know, there are a lot of young men that dominate 12 and under. And then all of a sudden, you know, vitamin T, as I call it, kicks in. The testosterone kicks in, and then you know the the guy that was nobody at ten is now you know through a ninety plus at seventeen, and so, but you know everybody thinks that you, if you dominated twelve and under that you know you're going to be the next superstar. And more often than not, that's not the case. You know, girls is a little bit different because they don't they have a tendency. It's interesting with girls that I've seen in uh, that their body type changes. I think we discussed this offline, you know, they can be phenomenal. And then I've seen it happen in swimming, um, with some of the friends of my daughter who's totally dominated at 12 and under, and then, you know, puberty hit and their body changed and they really struggled because swimming is a, is a sport where, you know, moving through the water is, and if you're, if you're, anything changes in your body um, mm. substantially, that's going to throw off your ability to move yourself through the water. And, you know, or it's like or running, you know, cross country, whatever it is. There's a lot of things that can affect a girl. Um, so whereas you know, guys sometimes benefit more from the body change. Make sense? Yeah. You know, that, that burst of testosterone and that muscle, because like when our daughter was swimming 12 and under, most of the people, the young men in Loudoun County, she would just obliterate. She was that much faster than a lot of the boys she swam against. Then all of a sudden, you know, puberty hits, vitamin T kicks in, and these guys are just blowing her doors. It's not even close. It's because it's 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 bigger, stronger, faster. And so there's, and it's it's not her fault. It's just it's just Mother Nature kicking it, you know. And so that's why they have different times and um you know time standards for women as they do for men yeah totally acceptable that's just that's just life in general yeah, yeah and that's my belief is like i mean the cream is ultimately gonna rise you know when, once high school comes usually like so if if you and i were the same age uh as youths and i spent uh you know 12 months of the year playing football and baseball and you and you didn't do anything but then you decided to take up baseball and football in the ninth or tenth grade you're going to be better than i am because you're a better athlete you're bigger and faster and stronger and so it's like all that investment emotional financial you know can i mean if the goal is okay my kid's going to be this great player who's worthy of getting a scholarship i mean it's all it's all going to happen. Most of it's going to happen naturally, right? Yes. I couldn't say it better myself. Yes. You're just blowing, you know, a lot of, a lot of hard work goes a long way, but the fact of the matter is, you know, God sprinkles athleticism on people and, um, and you know, they're, they're just, as you know, cause you see it at covering Clemson football, the Clemson athletics in general. I mean, the, the, the athleticism of the young men uh, that you see there playing is just, sometimes it's unworldly. And a lot of that wasn't, let's face it, a lot of it wasn't hard work. It was just what they were, you know, blessed with. Now they worked, they worked at their craft to get to that point. But, you know, you can pour all the money in that you want and, you know, all the clinics and all the travel ball and all the T-shirts and all the Oakley sunglasses and all the, you know, all the nice stuff. 
but in the end, it's still going to come down to, to athleticism. And that's the great common denominator of it all. Yeah. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. That's just like our daughter. She just born, she's just blessed athletically. I mean, this is the way it is. She was always, she, from the time she was playing t-ball down in Georgia when she was four or five years old, she, was, she, she played with nine little boys on her team. She was the fastest kid on her team. <laughs> and she played, it was all boys. That's great. In, in Georgia, yeah. She, I'd line them up against the fence and have them race, and she'd beat all of them in a race. She just, I mean, she'd play pitcher on t-ball. The kids would hit the ball. She'd run, pick the ball, and run and beat the kid to first base. So that's nothing you can teach. That's just what she was born with. And um, and so that translates when she gets into the water. And now she's, you know, now she's swimming on a Southeastern Conference championship team, which is elite. When, you, when you're teammates and you can beat Florida and Georgia and Alabama and Auburn and Texas A&M and Tennessee, you know, that means you're, you're pretty doggone good. I mean, it's just the way it is, yeah. you know. And then their coach here at the University of Kentucky um, is a guy named Lars Jorgensen. He swam on the 1988 U.S. Olympic team. He was an All-American at Tennessee. So he knows what it takes to get to that level. And Kentucky, it, here, the, the women's program, they don't get the five-star recruits they do at Stanford, for instance. Um they get the four and three and four star recruits. Uh, our daughter was probably a four star, high four star recruit. She wasn't a five star, um, and she was an all American. But you know, it, and to be an all American swimming, you have to be uh, top one hundred in your event in the country in high school. And there was, I think, in her junior senior year, there was like almost eighty thousand young women that swam varsity swimming in the United States, Jeez. and she was in the top one hundred of those 80,000 for her event. And then she gets to Kentucky. Everybody's an All-American. You know, stand in line. That's just the way it is. So, uh, but, yeah, it's, a lot of it's got to do with, it's just, just funny, funny story. When I was back as a student volunteer assistant at Clemson, coaching football in 1987, and um, Bill Oliver was our uh, secondary coach, and he was also the co-defensive coordinator with Tom Harper. And um, we were in a film study one day. And I, I, I don't remember who the player was. And I don't remember exactly what happened, but there was a bust in the coverage. right? And so we were watching the film. And um, lights are off. And his back when film was real to real, right? You know, so the projection going, wah, 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 when, it, wah, yeah, and when it was actually film. So, <laughs> yeah, it was actually film, right? <laughs> so anyway, I'm sitting in the back because I'm the volunteer student assistant. And um, he shuts the, he <laughs> the projector off. He goes, Billy Man. He used to call me Billy Man. He goes, Billy Man, turn on the lights. So I, yes, sir. So I turn on the lights. And he looks at the player in question. He goes, and I'm paraphrasing it, but it's, it goes something like this. He goes, son. If I put you out in that field and you don't know what to do in a certain situation, well, that's my fault. He said, if I put you out in that field and you know what to do in a certain situation, we've practiced this and you don't do it, that's your fault. He said, but son, he looked at me and he goes, if I put you out on that field and I've told you what to do and you know what to do, and you can't do it, <laughs> that's just your mom and daddy's fault. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> Turn the lights back off. I was like, ooh. But it goes to your point. I mean, it's what your boy, you know, and he made the point. <laughs> Some, it's your mom and daddy, it's your mom and daddy's fault. You can't do it. And so I think it's one of the great all time stories. It was like, man, that's brutal. But that's, that was, that was coach Oliver telling one of our players that, uh, he looked, he basically told him, Hey, look, you don't, you know, what? I don't know what to tell you. You, just, you can't make that play. You know, and uh, and sometimes it is what the good Lord gave you. Sometimes you just can't break on that football. Sometimes you just can't make that play when the ball's in the air, and um, nothing you can do about it. You can try all you can try all you want, but it ain't gonna happen. So, so as a as a as a parent who knew early on that his child was was exceptional, how did you handle? your relationship sort of in that, in that realm, uh, athletics realm, were you kind of hands off or were you like, okay, 
I'm going to have to sort of, uh, you know, help motivate her, drive her to, to achieve what I think she can achieve? Or, or did you leave that to, to, to coaches and such? Like, how do you handle that? Well, probably like you, uh, it's, when you're younger, they don't know anything. I mean, they're, she's just getting in the water and swimming. So I would help her, you know, motivational techniques. I mean, I, I was her strength training coach. I mean, she started, when she really started swimming, you know, we have a gym in our home in Virginia. And she she could, I mean, this is no exaggeration. There's no need to exaggerate it. I had her doing, she could jump up and do 15 to 20 perfect pull-ups in our, you know, in a pull-up bar you know, in our house, she, you know, she was doing box jumps and she was, she was strength training at eight or nine, 10 years old, all monkey exercises, stuff that you can do, you know, body weight stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, um, and so there's a lot of motivational things I would post on the wall for her and, and I talked to her a lot about it. And then as she, as she got older, when she got to be 12, 13 years old, you know, you slowly pull back on that. And when she was in high school and she swam, she went to the Madeira school in McLean and they, they won a state championship, uh, the Vista state championship her sophomore year. And then she was an individual state champion, um, her junior year, um, which is, you know, obviously very hard to do. Um, but I, I backed off even further and further from that and just let her, let the coaches coach her. And, you know, because she had high school coaches and she had summer league coaches and she had your year round club coaches. So she, she had three different sets of coaches she's dealing with, um, not to mention strength training coaches and all those things. And so, but the main one for her was her year round coach, whether it was snow swimming in Loudoun County or it was fish in McLean or if it was the nation's capital swim club, those people are the ones that are really there. And you don't, you have to, you have to take a step back as they get older. But when she was younger, yeah, I was big into motivation and, and, and uh, expectations. But then when she got to be in high school, it was pretty much hands off. Um, praise her. You know, I was there to praise her when she did well. And I was there to pick up the pieces when things didn't go well. And, you know, as an athlete, we all know that you're not going to win all the time. You just don't. And you got to be there to pick up the pieces for them emotionally when uh, things don't go their way. So, um, but I, you know, I, they get older, they get, they get, let them grow. And, uh, and if she knew she's always there, uh, for me to pick up the pieces if things didn't go the way. And then I wrote her a very long letter the day before we took her here to Kentucky to drop her off about expectations of a division one athlete, because you really don't understand what it's like as a division one athlete until you get to school because, um, you know, high school is one thing and club is one thing and travel is one thing, but the jump from high school or club or travel to a place like Clemson or Kentucky or South Carolina or Stanford is just astronomical. And a lot of the kids that she swam with, I would tell them that. And, you know, they'd kind of go, Oh yeah, thanks Mr. Davis. Appreciate that. And then, you know, they'd come back six months later, Mr. Davis, you were right. I go, yeah, I kind of know what I'm, I don't know much, but I know what I'm talking about when it comes to that stuff. I say, it's a job. I mean, you've got to be totally committed. It, it, and I said, this is what the coach is. This is how the coach, whether you're playing, whether you're running cross country, you're swimming, or you're playing baseball, or you're playing football, this is how the coaches put feed their families. This is how they put bread on the table. And you are the reason. That, this is how they get there. And so it's a job. I mean, it's, and so this is, it's not like in high school where, you know, Mr. Johnson's the football coach and he also teaches math. You know, this is, this is what they do. And it, especially, the, you know, in the Atlantic Coast Conference or the Southeastern Conference, I mean, there's a lot of expectations. There's millions of dollars that are put into it, and they expect results. So just, Soph had a good friend of hers from um, Boulder, Colorado, that she came in with her freshman year back in August. She lasted about two months. She went home. She said, I, I, I don't want to go to the school where my whole life is swimming. Mm. And, uh, it is, I mean, and I ran into a young lady that I've known for years that was a tremendous softball player that where we live in Virginia. And she originally committed to the university of Louisville. And then she transferred to James Madison university and she got injured really bad. She ended up her career at George Mason playing softball there in Fairfax. 
And uh, she said, yeah, Mr. Davis, she goes, you know, um, she's 23 now. And she says, the coach has always said, as a student athlete, you have three choices and you got to choose two. You have, you have athletics, academics, and social life. You got to pick two out of the three because mm-hmm. you can't do all three. And I said that that pretty much sums it up right there. So thankfully, our daughter has picked one, most importantly, academics and two athletics. Mm. She has no social life. I mean, it's just, you know, and they they do things. I mean, you know, she plays ping pong with the baseball players or whatever. But I mean, they just don't have time. She's she's so exhausted. Most of the night she goes to bed. She's in bed by eight thirty, nine o'clock. I mean, this is Division One. You think it's a glamorous life. By no stretch of the imagination is it. It's 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 pure work for you know. Now the glamour is you can you're, you can always say you were a champion, but I mean there's a lot of hard work that goes into it, and not many people appreciate it. You know we appreciate the Trevor Lawrence's of the world and the Travis Etienne's and and the Justin Ross's of the world because they they bring a, us a lot of joy in front of hundreds of thousands of people and millions on television, but there are a lot of other division one athletes that work as hard or probably harder than they do for a lot less reward. So, um, you see the other side of it. I, I saw the glamorous side as an athlete at Clemson and I've seen the, the hard work and the un- unglamorous side having a, a student athlete as, as a child at Kentucky. So, uh, and there's a, I got a great Dabo story for you if you have time. Yeah. Speaking of swimming, um, so Sophie had her, where are we now, Sophie Davis meeting with her coaches at Kentucky, and you know it's one of those things they bring in and they go, hey, you know, you fantastic teammate, um, you know, you're the first to practice, you're last to leave. Of course, these are all things that I told Sophie. You know, you will be the first one to practice, you will be the last one to leave, you will be a good team. And I said, You have to do this. I said, The coaches will watch this. So they were like, We love you, your potential's through the roof. Um, you know, you're a great teammate, um, but you know, all, all the right things. And so they go through everything, and, and okay, great, thank you so much. And I love being here. And you know, oh, one more thing. Yeah, what's that, Coach? Hey, do you think your dad could call Coach Sweeney <laughs> and get him to do a Zoom call with us wow. before the uh, before the um, the Tennessee meet? And she's like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> so I get to I, she goes, Hey, Daddy, you know it's great. I mean, she's nineteen; she still calls me Daddy. I go, oh, yeah. I go, What's up, sweets? She goes, Hey, um, Coach Lars uh, asked me if you'd be able to call Coach Sweeney and see if he could do a Zoom call f- with us before the Tennessee meet. Because they, they were swimming against Tennessee, and they hadn't beat Tennessee since 1999. Um, I'm like, well, sure. I mean, I'll throw a call in. I mean, I know he's busy. But now, th- th- this is the same week, literally, as Trevor gets COVID. This is Boston oh College week. Oh, my gosh. I-, I kid you not. So I called him. It was Monday, right? I called him Monday afternoon, got his voicemail. So he called, so called me So he calls me back about four hours later. Hey man, you can hear him. Hey man, love to do it. He goes, you know, I, you always been with me, and I love you, and you know, and, 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 and I'm like, hey coach, you know, I, I think the world of it. And I really appreciate. It. He goes, no, 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 anything that helps you, that it don't matter. He goes, you know, I would love to do that, and, you know, because that's the kind of guy he is. Now this is the guy. This is the head coach of the number one ranked team in the country at the time, right? I mean, it's not like he's coaching it. No offense, at Gardner Webb or something. And he's this is this, he's the head coach at Clemson. And this is Monday. So I said, he goes, well, when do they want to do it? I said, well, uh, I don't, I'm going to cut myself out of this as the middleman. Here's Coach Jorgensen's number. Y'all work it out. So he does a he does a 45 minute Zoom call <laughs> with University of Kentucky swim and dive. <laughs> On Wednesday, right? I well, got the pictures. That's the day. Isn't that the day they found out about Trevor? I think they found out that afternoon. Wow. Yeah. That's the kind of guy he is. I mean, I can't make it up. He, the dude's unbelievable. I mean, how many? Do, I mean, how many major Division One coaches would do a Zoom call with the, the you know, swim and dive team? And he did. And don't you know? The next day, they went out and beat Tennessee that weekend. 
that weekend we were there on Saturday and they went out and beat Tennessee uh, Friday. They went out and beat Tennessee. The Kentucky women did for the first time since 1999. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, but that's, that is Dabo swing. I mean, and I've never, I've told that story to a few people, but now obviously it's out there. I didn't make it public, but it, that's the kind of head coach that we have at Clemson. I, I, I venture to say that there are very few Division One head coaches, whether it be in the ACC, the Pac-12, the Big Ten, the SEC, that would take 45 minutes out of their extremely busy schedule to do that. But he did. And, um, I mean, I don't know what else to add to that. I mean, I would think, remarkable. yeah, the, the, you, the most that you would think that most coaches would, would, would do would be to, like, record a – a video message, you know, like a 30 second, Hey, go get them, you yeah. know, uh, kind of a little, a bit of inspiration and then send it to them. <laughs> Not sit there yeah, for 45 no. minutes during a game week. No, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and then the, the, the stuff on Trevor broke later on that afternoon, I think, or the next day. I think Thursday. it was Thursday. When everything yeah. I think it might've been Thursday. Cause DJ only had one day to get ready. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, so oh, I mean, that's my that's my uh, that's my Dabo Sweeney story. I mean, that dude is just tremendous. It's just ridiculous. So they sent him a, a nice sweat, you know. So now he's like, so anyway, they, of course, you know what they call Sophie's nickname now on the swim team is Dabo Davis. Of course, they call <laughs> it Dabo. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. So. um Anyway, but that, that's it, it. Does your heart well, and you know he's known Sophie since she was just a little, a little thing. So, uh, but um, that's all. It's all intertwined. My, you know, my relationship with Clemson and, and Coach Sweeney, and it goes back years, and uh, you know, and then it comes to fruition for for them to uh, to beat Tennessee, and then eventually win the whole Southeastern Conference Championship. So, anyway. Uh, a proud moment, a proud dad moment. I'm sure, I'm sure you have a lot of those waiting in ahead of you. And that's that's what being a dad is all about. Is you know the, those 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 moments in time where you get to enjoy. Because man, it goes by so fast, especially when they, once they get to high school. Any dad out there, whether you have a son or a daughter, when they start playing in high school and they get busy doing their high school stuff and they start growing up, you can't believe how fast it goes. Like I just from like when she got. I mean, she got her acceptance letter to go to the Madeira school. I remember it was like, it just happened. Now she's a freshman. You know, she's almost ready to finish her freshman year in college. Just like that. Man, the pe- po- folks at Tennessee have to be like, Dabo, please stop. Like, t- 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 for, you know, T. Hig- T. Higgins and Mari Rogers, Trevor Lawrence grew up a Tennessee fan, and now he's now he's yeah. slaying the uh, swim team. Now he's slaying the swim and swim and dive team. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, there's no – I don't know about Alabama and Kentucky, but I know there's no love loss between Alabama and Tennessee, so maybe that was part That's of true. It. Hadn't thought of it that way. Know. Yeah, I didn't um, either until right now. Want to share a quick word about Founders Federal Credit Union? If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to foundersfcu.com. At Harris Home and Harris Commercial, they want you to get every detail right. Harris means beautiful design that delivers taste, style, and comfort. It's a legacy of integrity built by generations of outstanding reliability and service. It's all about creating just the right look, the perfect feel, and dependable function for every room in your home or any business setting. Folks at Harris are Clemson people based in Anderson. A lot of Clemson University's recent facilities improvements have Harris's fingerprints all over them. For endless flooring possibilities and breathtaking renovation, the only name you need to know is Harris. Website is discoverharris.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parm Smith and Archenthold. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-3507. 
Um, so actually the reason that I reached out yesterday was, uh, to, to talk about the, the series of articles ongoing at Tiger Illustrated, the Danny Ford era, the Danny's days, um, which is really, I don't know. It, it what fascinates me is seeing someone like you, uh, who, you know, obviously was a part of it being fascinated by what he's reading and, and, and sort of remembering things being reminded of things you know those days and the fact that somebody like you is is engrossed by it is really cool to me so I'd just like to to sort of get some of your I guess general thoughts on 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 going back and, and reading some of that and and just what your what your sort of dominant take is on it yeah I was fascinated by it because a lot of the stuff I you know, I think I know you saw my quote. I was like, oh my goodness, I never knew some of that even happened. And yeah. thank goodness I didn't. Because, you know, obviously, you know, old days, 1980, 81, 82, there's no internet. You know, there's the Greenville News and there's the, the state and there's the Anderson Independent Mail. And that's about all the information you would get except for, you know, the local news on TV, which you really didn't even have time to watch. Or what was published in the Orange and White. Um, you know, the old public, and that's where we, we've had a lot of our information from the orange and white, because we really just didn't know what was going on. I mean, it was, a, there was an information vacuum. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think they, they kept a lot of it from us. And it's just, you talk about, you know, the NCAA investigations. And I mean, I didn't even know, and this is the God's honest truth. You're talking about, well, you know, they were on campus after the such and such game. I had no idea the NCAA was on, on campus. And I was on the team. <laughs> and, you know, there was 25 guys or so that were interviewed. And I didn't know what was on. And, I, you know, they didn't come to me. And, like I said previously, I was the number one recruit in the state of Virginia my senior year. If you think anybody that ended up at Clemson during that time period that would want to be interviewed by the NCAA, it would have been the number one recruit in any state. Whether it was Mississippi, Virginia, Pennsylvania, would pick your state, right? Not a, not a peep. Never heard anything from the NCAA. And Mm -hmm. so uh, that's interesting. But then you talked about a lot of things that were happening with, you know, with Dr. Ashley and Coach Ford and some of the things that were said. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, none. And and a lot of us didn't. We just, we were so, you're so engrossed as a student athlete just trying to survive every day, practice and school and the expectations. Not to, you know, and you, the students are around, and you know, you had a publication of Tiger, and you would read stuff in there. But the things that were swirling around the program, uh, a lot of it, you just you really put blinders on and just tried to survive to get through every day. The gauntlet, which was you know a weekly practice session under Danny Ford. You know, you try to get through Monday and then Tuesdays and Wednesdays were full pads, which were brutal. It's full contact all the time. Thursdays was a walkthrough. You had Friday to do what you had to do to get to where you had to go or go to Anderson. And then you played on Saturday, which was like a vacation. The games were, were easy compared to the, the week of practice. And so um, for you to illuminate or shed light on what was happening in the maelstrom, which was those those investigations and the probation and all those other things, um, you know, almost forty years later was a really eye opener. It was an eye opener for me because the first time that y'all published it, I was, I think it was two thousand twelve. You said, and I was right in the middle of the two thousand and twelve presidential campaign with Vice President Biden, mm-hmm. and I didn't have time to it hardly do blow my nose, let alone read Tiger Illustrated. Mm-hmm. So that's probably why I missed it. But, um, you know, credit to you for, you know, bringing the truth out. And some people, you know, I saw where they're, you know, it's the hit job or whatever. Like, no, it's not. It's the truth. And the truth needs to be, the truth needs to be brought to light. And, and the light shines on what the program is now. And it's night and day. Yeah. How things are run, the expectations of the program how the players are taken care of, how, um, how, how everything is done from, from, from A to Z. I mean, there's virtually no comparison whatsoever. And um, I think that's, that's obviously a credit to, one, William Christopher Sweeney, two, 
the athletic department, Dan Radakovich and his predecessor, you know, uh, Terry Don Phillips, uh, three, President Clements, and then, uh, of course, four, the Board of Trustees, um, two of my former team, teammates, which are on the Board of Trustees, Bill Smith and Mark Richardson. That, that four-pronged attack is why, you know, we had 45,000 applications at Clemson this year to get into school. 45,000 applications. It's unheard of. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that needs to be brought to light, man. I and mean, there was some, there were some bad times and there were a lot of bad things going on. Uh, you know, from the recruiting violations of which I never saw any of it. Uh, Lord is my witness. I, I never, never witnessed anything other than Clemson coaches probably be in my house one too many times, but there were other schools that probably showed up there a few, you know, that, that was just kind of a pop in thing. Um, but as far as illegal activities, money, gifts, anything like that, never saw it. Not one time. My, you know, like, but we knew the other guys were getting it. You knew and you knew who they were. Um, and that does cause a problem because we're all teammates. We're all supposed to be equal. Now, we know not everyone knows no one's equal. I mean, you have your Perry titles of the world and you have your home. You know, those kind of guys are different than you know, your rank and file people, but, um, uh, th- that doesn't make it, you know, it doesn't make it right. And, um, so anyway, we paid the price, unfortunately, and it was the student athletes that paid the price. Most of which we never saw anything. And it, uh, it's really unacceptable when you look back what happened to our pro, you know, my, my junior was 82, Right, we we win the ACC championship, and um, we were supposed to go to the Orange Bowl again, but we didn't go because we took that as a as part of the probation. And then my senior year was no TV, no bowl game, and no conference championship. So the only reason we got up to go play was because we were playing, you know, for our teammates, our family, and for dear old Clemson. There's no, there was no reward. There was no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and. Um, you know, could have had a lot of excuses just to ditch it, but we didn't because it was a lot of personal pride. And, you know, you weren't, you really don't play sports. You don't play, I never did, just, you know, to go to bowl games. So you play because you love the game. You love to play the game. That's why you're out there. I was like, well, I'm going to go to Clemson because, you know, I may get to win a national championship. I'm going to go there because I, I, I feel comfortable there. They want me there. I don't want to play in Death Valley. In the, the operative word is play, and then whatever comes as part of that, what your reward is, whether it's a conference championship or a national championship or a great bowl game, those those are the benefits. Things have changed now, athletically. You know, there's much more the, the incentives there. I mean, you know, you'd have to be crazy not to want to come to Clemson and play for Dabo Sweeney because he. Um, you, the, the program that's been put in place, whether it's the facilities or, you know, the academic support and the chance to win a national, a very good chance to win another national championship is very attractive. So I understand that part of it too, but, but I appreciate you bringing a lot of that to light. It, it didn't, it doesn't offend me at all. It's actually rather liberating because it's almost like the, it's like a, a, a bad family secret that everyone's trying to hide for years. I mean, we all know it's there. And then finally it's out in the open and it's kind of a relief to get it out in the open. Yeah. And when the series ran in, I guess the summer of 2012, you put yourself back in that time at that point, you know, there was still a lot of doubt about Dabo. They had just, gotten hammered by West Virginia, even though they had won the ACC title, the 70 to 33 yeah. was still fresh in everybody's minds. And so, uh, yeah, try, try living 15 minutes from West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. And so there wasn't that, you know, unanimous conviction that, okay, this is the, this is the guy, uh, who's going to take us to the promised land. And so at that time when the series runs, it's like, Oh yeah, th- these were the glory days. And, um, you know, it, it, it sort of, there's there's more on sort of all the the glory I guess, whereas now it's like I think the the important perspective or revelation that comes from it is is like 
you know, for the folks who are, you know, still upset about what happened in New Orleans, you know, on the field in one game or, oh, gosh, it's been two years, uh, a two season drought uh, not winning a of not winning a national championship. It's like, man, there is so much to admire about right now, which is which is not um, which is not often how it happens, you know, where you're able to appreciate uh, greatness in the moment, right? Usually it's like only with the benefit of hindsight. You're like, man, those are, those are some awesome times. And so it's, it's a reinforcement, I guess, of how things have been done the right way, almost across the board compared to, uh, compared to the previous uh, glory days, I guess. Exactly. And, Make no mistake, uh, when it, so the game happened, and, and my father passed away on January fourth, and so the, you know the the game in New Orleans on January first, right? It was New Year's Day, wasn't it? I, 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 it was man, I, did, I did not know. I did not know your father passed. I don't. Uh, I don't yeah, my I'm dad sorry. was a huge. Yeah, I, I, yeah, he passed away on January fourth, and so I was dealing with. Um, the loss of my dad or getting ready to lose my dad because he was in hospice care. So that game to me is a blur anyway. I didn't, I, I was, I, I was so happy that, that they had won the Atlantic coast conference championship and beat Notre Dame and, you know, avenge that loss up there in South Bend where they were playing with one hand tied behind their back. And so I immediately went out and bought two Atlantic coast conference championships, t-shirts and, and a hat. And I wear them around all the time. I'm like, yeah, six in a row, dude, you know, how hard that is. And people poo poo all us to the ACC. I said, dude, do you know how hard it is to win a championship in anything? And to do that six times, well, regardless of whether FSU is down or Louisville is down or Virginia Tech is supposed down, whoever, you know, to go in and, and beat Notre Dame and take that from them when that's all they wanted. And to, to win six in a row, and like you said, and do it the right way, without a, a hint of impropriety, is is fantastic. And so, um, but yeah, to your point, when they when they lost to Ohio State, I I don't hardly remember anything about the game. Yeah, my dad passed on January fourth. He, he he died of uh, he had vascular dementia and. Um, he died of sepsis, but he had been sick since October. So the whole basically football season for me was a blur. Mm-hmm. But the um, he uh, but a good story here that I'll share with you that's emotional. I might break up talking about it, but anybody that's obviously plays ball with their dad or has done anything, my dad, you know, taught me how to play. No, he was my he was my coach for a long time. Innumerable hours in the side yard catching fungos, ground balls, batting practice, uh, punting. My dad was a pretty good punter. And so I honed my craft of, of, of catching punts, catching my dad's punts. Mm. I mean, he could punt it at least 40 yards. I'd, I'd sit out there for hours catching it behind my back with one hand, doing all those things that eventually led to me securing a spot as a freshman doing it for Coach Ford. Um, so it was Christmas Eve. And um, he was in a Nova Fairfax hospital. I was the only one allowed to see him because it was one visitor one time a day, you know, due to COVID restrictions. So it's Christmas Eve and I'm in there with him and um, I had to wake him up. It was in uh, early mid afternoon. And I said, Hey dad. And I took my hat off and, and my, uh, my mask off. And I looked at him, I got nose to nose with him. And I said, dad, it's Billy. It's your son. I'm here, buddy. And I said, how you doing, pal? And he could barely talk, and he's dying. And um, I said, how you doing? And, and this is a guy that at 74 had made the all-star team in the senior softball league. He was a 15 over league. So he was, he was quite a robust athlete up until the time he had his first stroke. And I said, Dad, are you all right? How you feeling? And he looked at me, and he says, I just want to play ball. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Powerful stuff, man. Oh yeah. So he's. So I looked at him and I said, I said, okay. Um, do you want to play in the infield or the outfield? And he says, outfield. I said, okay. How about you play center and I'll play left? And he goes, that sounds good, buddy. And then um, he said, uh, how about you bat cleanup and I'll. Um, how about you bat third and I'll bat cleanup? Is that good? And he said, 
that sounds great, buddy. So I sat there and stroked his face for a little bit, which, you know, is not really something I would normally do with my dad. And he, he fell asleep. And so I sat by his bed you know, for about another 20 minutes. And it was Christmas Eve. And, you know, I kissed him on the forehead and left. And um, he had a stroke the next day, Christmas Day, and lost his ability to speak. Mm. So that was the last conversation anyone had with my dad. And it was talking about playing wow. ball. Yeah. Oh, man. I had no idea. All that has to be still so fresh. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's terribly fresh. I mean, we, you know, because my mom was in a nurse and she was in a facility too because she had fallen and broken her pelvis. So I had both of them in the same place and then dad got sick. So he was, and then, then he went to hot, they called and said he was going into hospice the next day. So they kept him at the hospital. So it was a week of, you know, getting my family in to see him. And then he passed away on January 4th. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but that, that's, that's something, you know, when you have that relationship, it was a ball playing relationship, which I'm sure a lot of guys that are listening to this are probably, you know, it's, it's emotional, but that was my, that was my connection to my dad. I, he was a huge Clemson fan. You know, he was there in Miami and he was there for every home game. And he, the, you know, when they took him to the hospital the last day, he had his orange Clemson at him. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, and you were saying you were the first uh, member of either side of your family to to go to college. Was that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That was that was my out. I mean, I mean, my family all came from you know either Wales or Scotland or England or Germany or France or whatever um, as you know immigrants, and they were all worked in coal mines. My mom's side of the family was from um, Western PA. She moved down to Virginia when she was like four. But they all worked, you know, either on a farm or a grocery store clerk, or my dad was a mailman, worked in a grocery store. Um, and so for generations, I, I was the very first kid on both sides of my family to go to college. And so, yeah, that was, that was the, that was the, that was the only one. I mean, I was, that was the first one to do that. And Clemson gave me that opportunity to go to college. You know, I had the opportunity to go to the places, but Clemson is the place I fell in love with. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, I, you know, my dad, there were times where we didn't have any food in the house and we'd have to wait for my dad to bring the check home. So my mom could go out and get food. And we, I did not grow up in a, in a privileged environment at all. I mean, um, and so, and in one generation, you know, I was afforded the ability to go to Clemson and get a degree and then, you know, play a little bit in the NFL and then got a career in the Secret Service, of which I would have not had been able to be in the U.S. Secret Service as a special agent if I didn't have a college degree. And then, you know, my, our daughter got to go to the Madeira School, which is the number one private school in the state of Virginia. And it's, uh, you know, 318 girls and a lot of people go there, you know, it's just, it's an exclusive school. So in one generation, that's what an education can do for you. Um, to, to put, but, uh, yeah, I, so I, um, th that's the background. You don't, not everybody comes from, you know, as a, as a three car garage kid. That's for sure. And I, cer I certainly wasn't one of them. And I do believe that that made me a little bit more hungry than a lot of kids that I probably grew up with. I was blessed with a lot of athletic ability. Obviously, if I could play two sports at Clemson, I had to be a pretty good athlete. Um, that's just, just the way it is. But uh, a lot of it was just a drive and a hunger to succeed. And um, and that that was part of it. Like, I said, like you said, I was the first kid in generations never go to college. So, and we, you know, broke that streak and now, now, uh, you know, other generations will go and, and succeed even further. How many people were in the house growing up? Uh, at one time we had seven and, um, two sisters, uh, mom and dad and a couple pairs of in-laws. So, um, yeah, I didn't. One time, I never had. A, I didn't have a bedroom for like three or four years. I slept in the dining room. 
had a, a little rollout bed that I'd sleep in the dining room because it was a tiny little um, thousand square foot house, you know, three bedrooms and, a, and one bathroom and a, and a carport. So, yeah, I pretty much just I could sleep in the I slept in the dining room. That was my bedroom. They didn't sleep, you know, didn't sleep with my sisters and mom and dad had their own room. And then so everybody was kind of packed in there. So, um, yeah, interesting. So, but that's, that's the background on somebody, you know, and then you, then thankfully, like I said, the people at Clemson looked out for me, people like Bobby Robinson and Allison Dalton. And I got to, I got to go on and, and have a, a really, uh, cool career in the secret service and see a lot of things and do a lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's not all, not everybody comes from, uh, you know, like I said, a three car garage, uh, background. So, um, but thanks for asking that. I think it sheds a light on, on, on the way I look at a lot of things in life. Um, yeah. Like you wouldn't change anything. No. Well, I would change one thing. We've had that discussion before. I would have played baseball more at Clemson. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, like a lot of people don't, I was, when I got cut by the Broncos in 84 and my old high school baseball coach brother was wired into the Orioles, the Baltimore Orioles organization of which the Orioles kind of followed me through high school, but they knew I was, cause I had tried out to the Reds and the Orioles, uh, at the high school, but they knew I was locked into going to Clemson. So they didn't really push it, you know? And so when I got cut by the Broncos, I was actually supposed to go to spring training with the Orioles as a non-roster invitee in the spring of 85. Um, but then the St. Louis football Cardinals picked me up at the end of the 84 season. So, you know, I was under contract with them. I was on the team. And so this is, and I certainly wasn't Bo Jackson or Deion Sanders. So I wasn't going to go to spring training with the Orioles while I was under contract with the Cardinals. And so that kind of blew that opportunity out of the water. But, uh, yeah, that's a little known fun trivia fact mm. that, that I was actually supposed to do that because they had followed me and yeah, non roster invite you to spring training. But anyway, but I threw all my eggs in the, uh, in the proverbial uh, football basket and it kind of didn't go exactly as I planned, but that's, but you know, once again, we all get led in different directions and that's how I ended up, you know, in the secret service back in 1989. So that's that. Um, the cool thing is the guy that I supervised in the secret service, dear friend of mine. Now he's the agent in charge of the office in Lexington, Kentucky. Oh, so cool. yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of guys I worked with on the VP that now live and work in Lexington because the city of Lexington, actually the population is bigger population wise than the, than Richmond, Virginia, which is the capital of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So Lex is a pretty big place. So secret service has an office here, not going to know exact numbers or how many guys work here, but suffice to say that if Sophie ever gets jammed up, she has her own secret service detail that can take care of her within <laughs> five to 10 minutes. So that's a good thing for the daughter in college. Have you seen the Netflix film operation Odessa? No. Oh my gosh. Mm. Oh my gosh. It, it's an, it's incredible. It's about, it's sort of set in Miami in the early yeah. in the early nineties, I guess I'm pulling up the summary here on my computer. Three friends set out to hustle the Russian mob, the Cali cartel, and the DEA for the score of a lifetime. Uh, and it's wild, absolutely, it, almost unbelievable. Set in the early nineties, is that right? Because yeah. that's funny. Because I was in our Miami field office, U.S. Secret Service field office, Miami, from 1993 through 1996 or 95, early 96. And one of those years, 95 to early 96, I was in a uh, task force, it's called, and for those people out there in law enforcement that are listening to this, it's called HILA. It stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Task Force. And so I was uh, sent over to work with uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, and uh we had groups or seven groups and each, each group had a secret service agent an FBI agent, a, uh, an agent from customs, uh, border patrol. Uh, this is before it all came together. Um, city of Miami police department, uh, Metro Dade police department. Um, uh, let's see Broward County Sheriff's office, Monroe County Sheriff's office. And so we all, all we did basically was, um, 
we dealt with the Cali and Medellin cartels in, in South Florida. So surveillances, search warrants, all that stuff. Wow. So, um, yeah, I was right in the middle of it. I could, I'm not going to go into detail on it, but I did that. Um, it, it made me appreciate going up back to DC and going to the president's detail. Cause that's a young man's game when you're, <laughs> when you're doing that. And, you know, cause the stakes obviously are, are ridiculously high. So we saw some search warrants where, uh, against really, really bad dudes that, um, we actually would have um, advanced life support ambulances staged right around the corner from where we were serving the search warrants because we had, you know, we had really reliable intel that the guys were not going to be taken alive. Mm. So when you serve that search warrant at 5 a.m., you're going in through those doors. Um, you know, you kiss your wife goodbye. You know, you really don't know if you're coming home. Yeah. I mean, you really don't. So that's, uh, that's, 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 and that stuff goes on every day in law enforcement. It, it doesn't get any, doesn't get any notoriety. Uh, doesn't, you guys, guys and girls do that stuff every day, all the time, professionally. And, um, and they get no credit for it because it's this, it's the silent majority that does all the work and it's not easy work. And a lot of people don't want to do it. And, you know, I have the utmost respect for, well, I did it as a, as a federal agent. Um, I do have the utmost respect for your basic patrol officer, your state trooper, people like that. that are pulling up on, on situations. They have no idea what they're getting into on a day-to-day basis. Most of the stuff we did as federal agents, it was all choreographed, practiced. Um, you know, we had search warrants, we had indictments. We didn't do anything without a plan. And so we were, we could control as best we could. A lot of the things we were doing where the average police officer, man or woman, state trooper, when you pull up on something, you have no idea if it's going to go south or in which direction it's going to go. It's one of the toughest jobs in the world. And, um, you know, without going on my soapbox, the uh, police are under fire right now. And, um, for lack of a better term, and it's, uh, it's a shame because the vast, vast, vast majority of men and women in law enforcement are there to do it because, they want to, they want to help people and, and serve their communities. And, um, it's just, uh, it's a tough situation, but no, t- going back, I, I, I don't watch much of that stuff anymore. I never really did. Uh, it's like when people used to remember when West Wing was on and people go, did you watch the West Wing? <laughs> I go, why would I do that? I go to work there every day. Do you, I mean, it's not, I, would you, wherever you work, would you want to go home and watch a show about where you worked every day? Of course right. not. Right. Yeah. So I, I just like, no, I didn't see it. Are you, or did you watch the Veep? I said, no. <laughs> to watch the Veep. I get it. The, the funny story about the Veep is, you know, Julia Louis Dreyfus is the Veep, right, on her show, right? Uh-huh. Elaine Elaine Dennis on Seinfeld, yeah. and so I was a huge Seinfeld fan. Still am. I still I don't watch like news anymore, so I just like watch I watch cooking shows, Clemson and Kentucky Athletics, and Seinfeld reruns. It's pretty much what I do. <laughs> so, um, so one day I'm in my office in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building, which is right next to the White House. Right, it's in the same complex. It's part of the White House complex. And my guys walk in. And they go, "Hey, sir. Hey, not for nothing, but guess who's meeting with a VP today?" I'm like, "I don't know. I mean, it could have been anybody, right?" And they go, "Julia Louis Dreyfus." I'm like, "Laney?" <laughs> they go, "Yeah, man. She's going to be there at like 11." And I'm like, "I'll be there." So. <laughs> So I go over, I go out of my office, walk across West Exec, I go into the West Wing, up the stairs, and I'm standing right there in the NVP's office in the little ante room outside of his office. And uh, lo and behold, a couple, five minutes later, the door opens, and out walks Vice President Biden and Julie Louis Dreyfus. And she looks at me, she goes, hi, how you doing? I'm like, hey. So the vice president looks at me and says, hey, Billy, uh, we're going over to the agency because the vice president was going to go over and speak at the CIA, give an award out, which is, you know, a 10-minute drive from D.C. down G- uh, GW Parkway. So I'm like, yes, sir. So we go out and we walk down the stairs, and we're standing underneath the awning. We're all, and all the, all the vehicles are lined up. The motorcade's lined up, ready to go. So he walks out, and he's like, he's like, hey, yeah, this is my guy, Billy, you know, agent in charge. And she, she looks at me and she goes, 
She goes, hello, Billy. And like, it was like something out of a, a Seinfeld. I was like, hey, how you doing? So the guy next to him, who was the VP's uh, personal assistant, he's like, now this is a lady that has her own TV show, V. She, he looks at her and he goes, yeah, Billy's a big fan of Seinfeld. And I was like, dude, she's being me. I was like, you don't. You don't do. that's, the last, that's the last thing she wanted to hear. Was, I was like, you know, so anyway. But it was, it was funny. If you've ever watched, I don't know if you've ever watched Seinfeld or not. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, but there are a couple of times where they're in a limo, like she's in a limo with Yuri Testikoff, the Russian writer. Uh-huh. But when you're, you know, or and there's another one where they 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 um, got picked up by like neo Nazis or whatever. But when I'm riding in the limo and I'm in the right front seat and I've got Elaine Bennis in the back with the Vice <laughs> President of the United States, and I'm looking and going, "This is like something out of a this is like something out of my own TV show." <laughs> and she's asking questions. And he's like, yeah, yeah, these are my guys, and this is what we do. And we're driving down the GW Parkway. Of course, we're, anytime we go on a motorcade, we shut everything down. So we own the entire George Washington Parkway. There's nobody on it but us. And she's like, is there no? I go, no, we shut everything down. We own, there's, no, there's nobody here between us and Virginia State Police and the U.S. Park Police. There's nobody on the road. And she's like, wow, yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, like, it's like, yeah, that's what we do. Go up and down the road. No traffic, no, no waiting for lights. It's all there. So, anyway, that's that's as close as I get to the, uh, the the TV stuff. But there's a lot of cool little snippets from my old job, stuff like that 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 you you do that's fun that makes the job, you know, more than more than just doing protection. But it's uh, meeting a lot of fun people and, and doing some cool things. So yeah, I consider myself fortunate. Well, Billy, we are fortunate to have had you on for the last uh, hour and 20 minutes. Um, My goodness, I'm sorry yeah. it took that long, but oh, I think no, it was a good that, conversation. Yeah, that, that, that's what makes a uh, good podcast. So um, you're, you're, you've been very generous with your time, especially when you're up in Lexington uh, w- w- with family. So appreciate that and appreciate your service to the country and, uh, and your friendship. You too. I appreciate you, man. We've we've grown um, we've grown pretty good friends here since since I really first started talking to you. It was like about ten years ago. So um, well, no, it was yeah. it was uh, it was two thousand eight, I believe, because I remember I think I remember you at the Virginia game. Oh, was it two thousand eight? Yeah, it was yeah. longer than that. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, pretty, yeah, that uh, was so it's thirteen years. Yeah, yeah, we have a mutual friend, Andrew Miller, who still writes for the Post and Courier, I think, who. Who you who you knew before you knew me and I think you were pretty good friends with him. Yeah, so no, he, I still talk to Andrew all the time. Yeah. yeah, Andrew's still with the PNC. He's still there. He's not doing sports anymore though. You know, I did not know that. What's he doing? Yeah, he's he's doing he's doing like local news, okay. like local what's happening in the greater Charleston area. He's not he's not covering sports anymore. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right. It was I, I apologize. It was 2008 because we were. I was standing on the sidelines with my wife. You know, I was the only, like I was the only former Clemson guy that showed up back then. You know, uh-huh. everybody. You know, <laughs> so I'm there on the sidelines with Kim and Sophie and Hannah, and we're watching C.J. Spiller. You know, I'm, and so it's like, there's, I go, yep, that's C.J. Spiller right there. How about that? You know, and then Dabo walks up and he goes, he looks, he looks at me and he looks at Kim and he goes, Are y'all Kim? <laughs> <laughs> you can hear him saying it. You know, kind of cocks his head. Y'all can't. And I go, oh yeah, hey coach. I go, you never met my wife. This is my wife, Kim. These are my daughter's hands. So <laughs> then he, you know, he rides. Up. They beat Virginia, I think, in a close ball game. And you know, the rest of it they say is history. You know. So, but yeah, that, so that's that's thirteen years. Wow, that's a long time, dude. Yeah, what Sorry. a history it has been. It's been a pleasure yeah. to be able to watch it, for sure. Yeah, anyway. All right, bro. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. Uh, best to all the Clemson Tiger fans out there, and I will put in a Go Big Blue as well. All right. It sounds good, all man. Right. Be safe. All right, bye. Awesome, awesome stuff there, as usual, from Billy Davis. Really appreciate him sharing his time with us. Also appreciate the support of our very loyal sponsors who make all this possible. Most of all, thanks to all of you for hitting that play button every week. Really appreciate it. Everybody have a great weekend. Cheers.